asking people to do is to really limit their social gatherings and social interactions with others, including their own family. If you have a vulnerable household member that has one of these comorbidities that we know is associated with a more serious outcome, please, if you have gone to a party or if you have forgotten to wear your mask and you were with others, when you go see your grandmother or that aunt, please wear a mask. Please protect them. We're finding that the majority of community spread right now is happening from parties, either indoors or outdoors, where people are either their family or friends and believe there's no one there because everybody looks good. Everyone believes that there's no one there that has COVID, and yet there is someone there who has the virus. And they don't know they have the virus because a significant number are asymptomatic. So this social distancing is not a word. It has to be translated into practice. And I just talked to the governor about what are his plans if cases go back up, and he has a whole series of mitigation efforts planned if the cases go back up, and what he's gonna ask every Arkansas scholion to do right now to ensure that children can go back to school and people can go to college, and we really talked about if everyone through this first term did those things, made those personal sacrifices, we could move forward and still have cases come down. And I think it's great to hear about what the hospitals need, what you need for additional testing, to really hear about his testing surge plan. We have a very good plan for what to do if there's an outbreak in a school, very good plan about what to do if there's an outbreak in a university and really how the federal government can be even more supportive of Arkansas and really understand what is needed. We have been privileged to drive around this country. I think we've put seven or 8,000 miles on the car in the last four to five weeks. And it's really started in Arizona all the way across the south into Florida all the way up the east coast. And this trip was really about the middle of the country because whether you are in Oklahoma or Arkansas, Missouri or Kansas, Iowa or Nebraska, we're seeing cases. If you're in Oklahoma, 50% of the counties have more than 5% test positivity for COVID. In Arkansas, it's about 65%. So we are seeing the virus in these states. And so, and the state right above you and the states right below you. And so collectively, we have to do these things to stop the spread of the virus. And so it was a great dialogue. It's really important to listen. So this trip is about a listening and dialogue and really understanding, and then taking the things that we see back to the White House so that they can be then provided to other states and governors that have maybe very similar situations and issues. So I'll stop there and see if there's questions. With school one week out today here in the state, what's your thoughts, what's your message to parents, teachers, students? Just remember, if there's an outbreak in the school, it's coming from the community. And the best thing we could do today for every single person in this state is to bring those case numbers down community by community. And that has to do with every one of us taking the social responsibility to bring those cases down. And that's the mass, the social distancing, avoiding crowds, not having parties in your home, not going to backyard parties, and really ensuring that we can get those cases down so that children don't go to school already infected because of what has happened in their community. I'll ask you this the way that the teachers union here has asked this. On a scale of one to five, with one not very concerned and five very concerned, where do you fall in terms of after hearing the governor's plan for people going back to the in classroom? So across the United States, every place is different. Um, and every county and school district in Arkansas is different. And that's what's really vitally important. It is important that every one of you go on the Arkansas Public Health site and know what's happening in your county and in your school district. And there's a separate site for school districts in Arkansas that's been put up, and I found it on the internet early this morning. And everyone should know what the caseload is in that county and school districts. If there's active circulation of high cases of new infections this week, you can assume there will be children who are infected that first day of school. And so this is what we have to stop right now. There are other counties that have very low viral spread. 
What we know happened across this next set of states, right above the southern states, is a lot of people went on vacation to the Panhandle, to Mobile, maybe even something far distance over to Myrtle Beach or over to Charleston. Those were sites that had high circulating virus. They brought the virus back with them. It's circulating in communities, and that's what we have to stop. So it really needs to be tailored to each and every community to really understand their cases and really understand what they need to do to stop the spread of this virus. Arkansas has said that every every school has to offer in-person instruction five days a week. Given the way you, you describe that, you talk about the decision being made at the community level. Should the state have such a statewide requirement? And the second question I want to ask you on masks. Um, you talk about the importance of masks. Why, if masks are so important, why not have a nationwide mask mandate? So we've been working with every governor, and if you watch across the South and the visits we have conducted, um, every one of those governors across the South, except for one state, has now a statewide mask mandate. And I think that is what we bring to the governors, is saying this is what we think is important to stop the spread. Um, the power for those kind of mandates and the enforcements of those mandates reside in the states also because we really need retail. I mean, obviously, if retailers are not demanding, it won't create the expectation that when we're in public, we have to have a mask on. And I guess what else I'm adding to that, if you're in private and you think you've been exposed or you think you've done something that may have created an exposure, like gone to a bar or been with 10 people, then I really want you to wear your mask indoors when you're with your grandmother or your grandfather or your aunt that may have cancer. I think it's really important that we do that to protect one another. And so each of these schools, and with the mandate here, we are seeing the cases coming down. So it does work. And on the five, five days a week enforcement instruction, is, is Arkansas in a position to require that, or require that of each school is given Something you know, each governor has to make that decision. What I heard from the governor is safety plans. In other words, giving everybody the option to, to out-of-school learning, um, at-home learning. And so a number of students and parents have selected that option. And so that has decreased the number of students who will be in the classroom. So we went through what that means for classroom size, what that means for cohorting the students, and then what they're going to do if they find a positive student and a positive staff, and really how they're going to inform the families. And we really talked about also sending information back to the parents of what they can do to stop the spread in their community. Because we can't put all of this onto the child. We also have to have the parents and the adults in the communities making good judgments of how they prevent community spread in their communities. Dr. Burks, you uh, mentioned the website uh, pertaining to school district level coronavirus data, um, but as far as I know in Arkansas that just includes all the community cases within a school district. Would you be in favor of a more uh, granular approach that would maybe not say whether someone's a student or a teacher, but talk about specific school related cases in a district? Well, you, you know, you ask a person to spend their life working to get the most granular data possible. Because I've always found the more granular the data, the more clearly you can make decisions down to the most local level and support those decisions. I think any level of transparency that can be brought to really assure parents that they will have the knowledge to protect their own children and what they need to do to protect the community. I think that's always very critical. So I would always want more granular data, but that's really a decision at the state level and the school district level. Would you also support having a separate, uh, maybe within the health department, a separate pool of contact tracers just focusing on the school district? Well, we talked about contact tracing, and obviously that has to be strengthened everywhere we work. Um, we've seen the number of contact tracers double and triple and actually increase by a log state by state. But 
we also need to make sure that tests are gotten back in a timely way so the contact tracers can utilize that information. And so that's what really I talked to the governor about. What are they going to do when they find a case? Do they have the capacity to surge in there and test students? And what they have right now with the public health group is the ability to do that with their public health lab support. So they have the ability to surge. That was very reassuring to me. That, know, that to know the capacity exists here to respond and really get to the data that would answer your question. Now, the governor does, does talk, Dr. Burks, on kind of a daily basis here about how the Arkansas Public Health Lab is working 24-7 to turn around test results and that it's really the commercial laboratory testing that's kind of holding the state back. Can the federal government do more to kind of loosen that burden on, on commercial labs to kind of turn around those testing tests? So I think we did two things which I think were really important to support the commercial laboratories. We worked with the commercial laboratories to be able to do this pooling, to be able to combine samples um, during that test. And that you can see if you pool four into one, that shortens the turnaround times by, you know, 75%. So that's huge. Um, many of the commercial labs have moved to that. One commercial lab or five of the six has really been able to bring pooling up and their turnaround times have dropped to 48 hours again. We do have one lab that we're working with, one commercial lab, very, very closely. It doesn't serve this area, it primarily serves the West Coast. But I think that's really a critical question. At the same time, we're trying to make antigen tests available to the states. That's a test that is rapid on site. Uh, we are taking those tests right now, and I know every American would want us to do that. We're taking them off the production line and getting them to nursing homes so that nursing homes across the United States can rapidly test their residents and staff. Just because we know nursing home residents are the most vulnerable to this virus, at least historically. But we also know, I just want to be very clear, the majority of the hospitalizations and the fatalities now are coming from multi-generational households and party or family gatherings where there's someone there that's vulnerable who's getting the virus from their own family members. That's what we have to stop in addition to bring down fatalities. Dr. Butch, what's the, is there a big difference between a Friday night football game with 5,000 people and a backyard party? There's a difference in that they can be in masks, and they can be not right up against each other in the stadium. You know, you can mark seats. What happens in the backyard parties is people take off their masks. So yes, there's a vast difference. You've got to be in a mask when we're close to one another like you are now. I'm going to take this lovely uh, woman. So <laughs> what do you think the federal government should be doing now to assist states? Where where is it falling short? What, what, what does the federal government need to do to improve testing, to get people to be aware of the virus? What, where do you think it's falling short? I think first and foremost, we really focused on getting real-time data, real-time data analysis, and real-time recommendations to the state officials. Um, through these governor's report. And I think that over the last eight weeks has been critically important. We have followed that up with them sending me out. So I've been in 19 states because you have to listen. It can't just be a one-way way where I send out recommendations and policies and I don't hear back from the reality on the ground and what people are actually seeing. And so that dialogue and being out across America has been critical. I will tell you what I hear across states. I hear across states that they still need support in testing and they need to do and they want to do more testing and you can understand why they feel that way and I understand why they feel that way. When you're talking about an asymptomatic virus, you have to use testing to find it. And so I understand the need there and that's why we're working with manufacturers to double their lines. That's why we're working with manufacturers to get these antigen tests out. And we will continue to do that. And I can tell you we're not going to stop until I feel like there's enough testing out there, both for diagnosis and surveillance. We've been working very closely to get this, and I know you've heard about it, the hospital data system. To really, we have an interim system. It is solely an interim system to get daily reports from hospitals of new admissions. 
I think that has been critically important to support the states to get their hospital data because that's how we then align the therapeutics that's so critical to hospitalization like the remdesivir. And so that kind of database has been very important. And part of that new database is what the hospital and nursing home PPE supply is. And so we just now rearranged and put more PPE out into the, the delivery system to ensure that hospitals, particularly small hospitals, were having a shorter um, amount of PPE. So that kind of data, data is valuable if you act on it. And that new data has allowed us to really see what hospital, particularly some of the smaller community hospitals that aren't part of big chains, we could see who needed what, what they needed, gloves, masks, gowns, and we were able to re rearrange and support that. That's what I'm hoping we can get to for testing, for PPE, for all of the therapeutics, and so that every American has what they need at the time that they need it, and we can see that and do it. And so we still have a ways to go to continue to improve on that system. But for the first time, every day, I can see every new admission across the country. And that has been extraordinarily important. CDC is working with us right now to build a revolutionary new data system so it can be moved back to the CDC and they can have that regular accountability with hospitals relevant to treatment and PPE. Please have one more question. Yeah. Yes, uh, federal government has had time, more than five months, it's had resources, it's spent trillions of dollars. So why isn't the United States leading the world when it comes to stopping the spread of COVID-19? I think there's probably three reasons for that. I think we've learned about the virus, but more importantly, we've learned what Americans were willing to do in combating the virus. Um, I'm asked this question all the time. And I wish that when we went into lockdown, we looked like Italy. But when Italy locked down, I mean, people weren't allowed out of their houses. And they couldn't come out but once every two weeks to buy groceries for one hour. And they had to have a certificate that said they were allowed. Americans don't react well to that kind of prohibition. And so what we've been trying to do, and why I've gone out to really work directly with states, but also to work with our tribal nations to really understand what they need. What would their citizens do? What are they willing to do? Because if our public health message that we carry is not something people will hear and internalize, when you're asking people to change behavior, you have to meet them where they are. And so I've tried to really carry the message of, this is what we know works, and this is what we know will stop the cases of the virus. And we demonstrated that, I think, very clearly in Arizona. We went out there with a new concept, a new model of the critical elements to stop the spread of this virus. And what did it mean? Closing the gyms, closing the bars. I know everybody gets horrified when I say that. Closing the gyms, closing the bars, 100% mask mandate, social distancing, no gathering over 10. If you look at the curve in Phoenix, Arizona, which you count online, you can see the power of that. That is the power of behavioral change that each American can bring to their epidemic. Now we know that that combination works. The malls were open, indoor dining was open at a reduced 50%, outdoor dining was fully open. So people were interacting, people were out, but people by just not doing those careful things were able to drop the cases significantly, probably by more than 80%. And that's the power that we possess. And so that's the message I'm carrying around the country. It's no longer theoretic. It clearly is working in America with Americans. And I think that's what, that's the message that we're bringing state by state. Are we talking tens of thousands of lives that can be saved if people who just wear masks? Tens of thousands of lives can be saved if we wear masks and we don't have parties in our backyards and taking those masks off. Somehow we always believe our family's safe and our friends are safe. You cannot tell who's infected with the virus. And so